Hello, this is one of our old episodes where our sound quality isn't quite so good and we're a bit amateur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we're pros and we've spoken about a lot more things and our sound quality is a lot better as you can hear currently. Yeah, so enjoy the show anyway. Thank Love you. the show. <laughs> Welcome to... The QSD of... HR. Episode 6. So this episode, I am going to be continuing the story of Sir Isaac Brock, our first guaranteed rate, um, as we see what happens in the War of 1812 against America. And I will be challenging my family to a Stone Age quiz. Yes, that's right. So I wonder who's going to win then. Will it be me, Granny or Bramps? Yeah, it's funny as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so what have you been up to since last time? Anything interesting? I have been ice skating... We put our Christmas tree up, didn't we? Oh, yeah, we put our Christmas tree up on Sunday, yeah. Yeah, we've got a kind of animal theme. Yeah, we put pretty much all my teddies on the tree and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Um, I had my work Christmas party, um, so that's why we're recording this a day late, as um, I was a little bit tired. So should we get on with the show then? Yeah, let's get on with the show. Sir Isaac Brock, part two. Yes, thank you. Now, can you remember where we left it last time, Anton? Um, we left it on a really good cliffhanger, and it was the War of 1812. Yes, it had just... Yeah. Um, America just declared war on Canada. Yeah. And oh, yeah, and they thought um, Canada would be a really easy target, and they could just march into it. That's right, but Brock had been busy preparing the defences, hadn't he? Yeah. So, let's continue our story, shall we? So, war with America has just broken out, and Canada, like he said, is expected to be a very soft target. Britain busy fighting in Europe against Napoleon. So, on to the war of 1812. Now, do you know when that happened? Do you want an exact date? Yes, please. 1812, um... Do you know when it ended? 1812? No, 1815. <laughs> so, just turn the two upside down. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. The Canadians, or the British, didn't have many troops, but remember, they did control the Great Lakes. Um, so, whilst the army was thinly spread out, they could rapidly move it with their ships across the water. <laughs> and this is going to be very important. Now, one of the first actions of the war was when a small group of soldiers, fur traders and First Nations warriors led by Captain Charles Roberts, attacked the American fort uh, Mackiniac. Now, the defenders didn't even know that war had been declared yet. So the Americans weren't aware of it. So they were taken by surprise and surrendered. <laughs> so this rapid early victory encouraged the other First Nations people to join the British in the hope of pushing American settlers for, from their ancestral homelands. On July the 12th, William Hull, he was an American commander. He led an invasion attacking a town called Sandwich, which is today called Windsor. Now this lies over the river Detroit. The attack was quickly halted, and this allowed Brock to start planning a counter-offensive, and he started to build a force at Amherstburg, which lies at the western tip of Lake Erie. And here's actually a map from the period. See, there's a Fort Detroit on the north of the river here. There's Sandwich down the bottom, mm -hmm. which is the town that was attacked. Brock reached Amherstburg on 13th of August, and there he met a First Nations leader by the name of Tecumseh. Tecumseh dreamt of an independent American nation, and he had grown up during the American Revolutionary War, so he had a lot of experience of warfare, and he immediately impressed Brock. In fact, Brock said of him, Here is a man more sagacious, and a more gallant warrior does not, I believe, exist. Against the advice of his officers, Brock planned to attack Detroit. Brock had two battleships, 1,300 soldiers, and about 600 First Nations warriors. The Americans had a force of 2,500 soldiers, and they were also in a fortified position across the river. Tecumseh's forces and British ships had been attacking whole supply lines, leaving them feeling demoralised and also short on food. They had also learned that the Americans had lost confidence in their commander, and it seems that he was quite a timid figure, and they also really, really feared the Native American warriors. So, the British arranged for a letter to accidentally fall into American hands, and it stated that no more Indians should be sent to Amherstburg, as there were already 5,000 there, and supplies were running short. So remember, there's only 600, really. Yeah. So it's just to kind of play the psychological game. 
Brock also sent a letter asking for whole surrender. And this may have been before or after the siege that was about to happen. I'm not sure because different sources have this in a different order. But his letter said, The force at my disposal authorizes me to require of you the immediate surrender of Fort Detroit. It is far from my inclination to join a war of extermination, but you must be aware that the numerous body of Indians who have attached themselves to my troops will be beyond my control the moment the contest commences. So he's playing on the fear there that the Americans had of the natives, thinking that they were going to butcher the American inhabitants of Detroit. Brock planned more tricks and ways to intimidate the American commander Hull. And one of these was he dressed his militia in the uniforms of regular troops, making his force of soldiers appear larger than it really was. He then got Tecumseh's men to march in front of the fort um, and then sneak back out of sight. So they'd walk in front of the fort, then hide and maybe go around the back of a hill or something, and then march past again. And he got them to do this several times, so it looked like there were more First Nations warriors than there really were there. Yeah, that's funny. Mm -hmm. so that's it's, yeah, it's pretty clever. And he also made sure that they weren't marching um, in a nice, ordered, disciplined manner, but they were really loud and noisy. And it was all designed to terrify the American defenders. And he also got them to light more campfires than required. So rather than like a group of, I don't know, 10 soldiers doing one fire, yeah. they'd light three fires and they all spread out. So it just made the force look much, much bigger than it was. Just remember, he's got far fewer troops here, yeah. particularly trained soldiers. Okay, so on the night of the 15th and 16th of August, Tecumseh's forces crossed the Detroit River and they were followed by Brock early in the morning. Brock's plan was to form his troops up for battle and draw Hull out of the fort and into open battle. But then he heard of American troops to his rear, so he decided to attack immediately. Now, as he always did, he led his troops from the front, urging the men forward, but facing them were two 24-pounder cannons. Their gunners ready, lit matches in their hands, so they're ready to fire. So let's hope it's windy, so the matches won't keep alight. <laughs> well, there's no need for that, because Hull actually ordered them to stand down and raise the white flag of surrender. And this was against um, the advice of the other American officers there. Hull was so terrified of the native warriors, and he, I think his wife was in the town and his daughter or something, so he was so scared for them as well. And the surrender may have also been helped by the fact that a British shell exploded in the officer's mess, causing casualties around that same time as well. He asked for three days to agree terms of the surrender. Brock gave him three hours. I think that's probably because he didn't want him to actually realise the true size of the army that yeah. was attacking. It's like, we've got to get this uh, sorted out quickly. And yeah, they surrendered. So with that defeat, the main American army in the region was no more. Brock took the city and used the captured supplies to help reinforce his own men. And this is actually the only time that a city on the American mainland has ever been captured by an attacking force. It's quite good. <laughs> so how many people do you think were killed in this battle? I don't think it's many. Well, there are 2,500 Americans defending. They're being pounded by British guns. And then we had, what was it, um, 600 First Nations people and 1,300 soldiers for the British and militia. I think it's going to be... About 700 people die. Take the two zeros off the end. Seven. Seven, only seven people. Which is obviously any death's horrible, but it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so there are only seven Americans were killed and two British gunners got injured. So that's actually an amazing testament to Brock there that he managed to take this Think, fort yeah. with such minimal fighting. It's incredible. You said earlier um, that I... Shell exploded? In the mess something? quarters, yes. Yeah. So that's going to be that, some Is of that stuff. the seven? Or I don't know seven. if that was all at the same time there, but I think that would have been a couple of them. Okay. I don't have the exact breakdown. The bad news continued for the American commander Hull. He was court martialed and sentenced to death for surrendering. Do you think that's pretty harsh? Well, yeah. So he managed to survive to die. Ah, uh, yeah, but <laughs> President Madison reduced is to a dismissal from the army in recognition of his service during the American Revolution. But that's how times have changed. Like, deserters and things would have been shot, and he would have been shot for um, cowardice. Now, this is a pretty bold move by Brock, attacking that fort head-on, and a lot of people thought he acted quite rashly. But luckily, his gamble paid off, and he wanted to continue pushing into America, having control over much of the Michigan territory. But an armistice between the two sides stopped the momentum and allowed the Americans to regroup forced Brock onto the defensive. He didn't know where the Americans might attack, 
so he needed to prepare defences all over Upper Canada. And that leads us on to the Battle of Queenston Heights. So on the morning of 13th of October, an American general named Stephen Van Rasselia III attacked, invading over the Niagara River. Now he wasn't a particularly experienced commander and he wasn't trusted by the majority of his troops. But despite this, and a heavy artillery bombardment by the British, the American troops managed to cross. The soldiers then followed a footpath up the heights from which the British guns were firing and managed to rouse them. As a coincidence, Brock had also arrived a few minutes earlier at the top of this kind of rise or this hill, hoping to get a better view of the battlefield. But with the American forces there, he was forced to retreat. Now, not wanting any more Americans to cross, he then led a quick counterattack. Then he himself again leading the charge on foot. It was said he always joined his men, never sending them where he would not go himself. So it's pretty brave leading the line, particularly as he had like this, you can see in this picture here, he had like this sash on that he had been given and he's got his officer's uniform, so he's going to be a prime target there. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit reminiscent of Alexander the Great, because he always liked to lead from the front and he got injured a lot of times in battle. I don't think it's quite up to Alexander the Great slip, though. Right? <laughs> and it's like, um, <laughs> no way. Um, it's like if you get um, a boss battle, the boss might have a few minions, but the boss will always be in there. So during the battle, the British were under heavy fire and the men were dropping back. Brock angrily shouted, this is the first time I've ever seen the 49th turn their backs. Surely the heroes of Urgmont will not tarnish their record. So he's trying to uh, get his troops to storm forward. Mm -hmm. This caused the men to push forward once more towards the American guns, musket balls whistling and whooshing through the air around them. Then one hit Brock on the wrist of his sword arm, but he did not stop. Now, I have an extract from a letter written by a soldier which portrays the real horrors from the battle. Yeah. Okay. So, I mm. think that Brock, he, he, uh, he can boost the morale of the, uh, at least the trained soldiers anyway but he can yeah. keep the morale up for his army. Yeah, he was popular among the soldiers, it's said. So, okay, so here's the letter. General Brock rushed up the mountain on foot with some troops to dislodge them. But they were so advantageously posted and kept up so tremendous a fire that the small number ascending were driven back. The general then rallied and was proceeding up the right of the mountain to attack them in the flank when he received a ball to his breast. Several of the 49th assembled around him. One poor fellow was severed in the middle by a ball and fell across the general. They succeeded, however, in conveying his body to Queenston. Just at this instant, we came up. We were halted 13 few moments in Mr. Hamilton's garden, where we were exposed to the shot from the American battery at Fort Grey and from several pieces directly opposite to us, besides the incessant disorderly fire of the musketry from the sides of the mountain. One of our men had his leg shot off in the ranks by a cannonball which carried away the calf of another poor fellow's leg. In a few minutes, we were ordered to advance to the mountain. The nature of the ground and the galling fire prevented any kind of order in ascending. It's pretty horrific there. Imagine all these guns firing, the smoke billowing up, cannon fire. And did you hear what happened to Brock there? In the middle of all of that? Yes, yeah, shot in the chest. Yeah. Hitting his heart. Painful. Mm-hmm. It says that as he fell, he called out, Push on, brave York volunteers! Or perhaps he said, Push on, don't mind me! Which is very British. Yeah. He didn't want his being shot to delay the advance. And this is actually what he was wearing at the time. And if you look, I've circled the bullet hole right in the middle there. Yeah, that's actually... That, uh, that's a clear hole. That's gone right through. Yes. Uh, in all reality, he probably died instantly, but I prefer to think that he cried out before his death, still pushing his men forward. I mean, he was only 43 years old. After his death, the British tried a second attack, with 70 to 80 men charging the now entrenched American force, numbering up to 400 men. Their battle cry was, REVENGE THE GENERAL! They did push the Americans back towards the gorge, but then they were defeated again and had to fall back themselves. However, the British would ultimately be victorious in the battle. Then we've got Colonel Meade's statement. Now, he was an American commander. Although our loss was great, and the issue truly unfortunate, the enemy have no reason to boast of their advantage. To them, it is a victory which will be remembered with pain. Major General Brock, an experienced and brave leader, was slain in the early part of the action. The British acknowledged that his death 
was more serious than would have been the loss of a thousand of the rank. They have no commander and the Canada's who can fill his place. So he's saying that losing a thousand soldiers would be better than losing Brock. <laughs> Since that much of an inspiration and leader to them and they have no replacement. So Brock was buried on the 16th of October 1812 with over 5,000 people turning out for his funeral and is given a 21 gun salute. Then later that same day, a nearby American fort also fired a salute. It shows the respect that they yeah. had for him. So these are Brock's possessions at his time of death, okay? Yeah. So we've got um, silver, four decanter stands, two French candlesticks, wine glasses, carving knives, a wine cooler, another decanter, two dozen tablespoons. <laughs> so these are silver. Then we've got plated, we've got a toast rack, fish knife, Six salt spoons, more decanter stands, more French candlesticks, more wine glasses, carving knives, 17 teaspoons, um, a pair of sugar tongs, one bottle knife, blue china, he's got 12 baking dishes, four vegetable dishes, fruit dishes, dinner plates, cheese plates, dessert plates, light blue china, more dinner plates, sugar plates, vegetable dishes, red china, sauces, cups, a bread basket, Two jelly moulds. Uh, wine. Two barrels of rum. One barrel of port wine. Yes, please. Sweet wine, clarets, gin, ale and porter. And he's got gridirons, ladles, milk chairs, tablecloths. Three dozen napkins. Uh, his furnishings. He's got a dining room carpet. I think chest my, of drawers. A chest of drawers, yeah. <laughs> pillows and pillowcases. One box of soap. Two dozen chairs and one black walnut table. He had three horses, he had a sleigh, and then remember we mentioned his library of books last time, so this is some of them. So we've got Samuel Johnson's works, Shakespeare's, Rowling's Ancient History, The Pope's works, Johnson's Dictionary, Murray's Drama and Exercises, Voltaire, volumes of plays. I guess um, the dictionary was for American then. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, map of Roads of England. So that's some of his possessions there. Yeah. Okay, so should we look at his legacy? So as you know, he was called the Hero of Upper Canada, and he's regarded as one of the nation's great military heroes. And he was also voted the 28th greatest Canadian of all time on a 2004 TV show. Now, I couldn't find the entire list of everybody, uh, but I did see that in 10th place was a ice hockey player. Probably the most impressive thing, Brock's Monument. Now, this is a 56 meter tall, it's 184 feet column. Now, this is bigger than Nelson's column in London. So only 51 and a half metres tall. And you know the Alexander Column in St. Petersburg by the Hermitage? Yeah. That is 47.5 metres tall. So it's bigger than both of those. Yeah. Massive. It's really big. Yeah, we've got a picture of it here. It's humongous. Yeah, so you can see the scale of it. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? Now, this is actually the second monument that was built. Because there was one before, which is a little bit smaller. But it's damaged by an explosion in April 1840 by an anti-British group. So how do you answer such attacks? You just make something even bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and um, it was also struck by lightning in 1929. But when it's oh, so tall... I thought it had electric powers. There's also a nearby monument to Tecumseh. Now, do you want to guess how big it is? Um, Native American well, Can I have leader? one clue? Is it bigger or smaller? It's smaller. Okay. 17 metres tall. Nope, it's less than a metre big. He should be remembered as well because yeah. um, he was a really important leader. He, he managed to gather together a lot of the native tribes in the area into a confederation. Um, and he was desperate just to give them a homeland. So I think it's sad that he's not remembered better. Yeah, I don't really like that, actually. Okay, so what, how else is he remembered? Well, there's loads of roads and towns named after him, including Brockville, where my work colleague said his mother lived, I think. But this was during the Christmas party. Yeah. After a few hours, so um, my memory's a little bit vague because uh, he's half Canadian. There are also lots of schools and, of course, Brock University. And um, here's a statue. You can see that he's got his books and his chest of drawers. That is actually, that is his chest of drawers, isn't it? Yeah. And some sort of ceremonial sword and then his hat. There's a scholarship for students from Guernsey. So if you ever want to study in Canada for a bit. Well, we looked at... Um... We found a cool insect website and there are loads of big spiders, so we ended up not wanting to go there <laughs> in the end. <laughs> 2012, a 0.99999% pure gold coin worth $350 was minted 
to commemorate the bicentenary of his death. <laughs> so almost totally pure gold. Yeah. I'm just quite happy, I think. There was this tiny, weeny bit of... Imperfection. I know, it's <laughs> terrible. It got chipped off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no, you don't want to do that. You get in trouble for us. I can't believe it's called where people would cut off the edges of coins. Yeah, that's, ones, why, they? And that's those... why um, you've got like on a 5p, mm -hmm. you've got all the, it's sort of Oh, the grooves around yeah, the edge, yeah. The, to make other coins. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. would melt them down and make other coins, yeah. And then of course, we have to say, Arise, Sir Brock, for he was knighted. Unfortunately, he never got to know this honour as his kill before the dispatch reached him. I just got knighted and yeah. I died. No! Then in London, there's a memorial in St. Paul's Cathedral. He also had a, a ship named after him, um, a Royal Navy ship, but that was destroyed before it was finished. <laughs> <laughs> it's been unfortunate. Um, there's some, also some barracks named after him in, um, in England. Then in Guernsey, we don't really have as much to remember him by here. But remember, he did leave the island when he was only 10 years old. Yeah. But with there are two plaques which we visited, and we've got a short recording now. We were in St. Peter, in the heart of the town, outside where St. Isaac Brock used to live, when he was up to about the age of 10, wasn't he? Yeah. So can you describe the building? Um, well, it's quite posh, and it's made... Uh, yeah, it's grey, and it's really cool. It's got lots of symmetrical windows. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's a large granite house, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, it's actually now Boots. Yeah. That's rather random, right in the heart of the high street. I mean, this is prime location here. Yeah. Um, probably that like, must be one of the premier kind of houses or properties yeah. in Peterport. So I've got it up on the wall, quite high up, so a plaque. So can you read what it says? Um, Major General Sir Isaac Brock, KB who saved Canada for the Empire. Lived here, born 1769, killed action 1812. Yeah, a bit of a spoiler there. Okay, now we're gonna walk down the high streets to where there's another plaque. Yeah. We're now outside the town church where there's another plaque here to Sir Isaac Brock. Mm -hmm. So it's saying how he got into the 49th Regiment that like we uh, went over before and yeah, and how he um, yeah, he served in Europe between yeah. 1799 and 1801. And the following year was posted to Canada. And then just how prior to the outbreak of the War of 1812, um, he became the president of the Executive Council and Administrator to Upper Canada. So erected by the Archaeological Historic Sites Board, Department of the Public Records of the Archive of Ontario. So it's actually... That plaque is yeah. thanks to you Canadians wanting it there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's actually a lovely day here, so we're going to go for a little wander back up the high street. Yeah. Okay, so that was us visiting the two plaques. Okay, so we're mostly done on Brock now, but who do you think won the War of 1812? British Canada. British Canada. Okay, well, both the British and the Americans say they won. Yeah. Um, so I haven't obviously gone over the entire war here, so it went on for another few years. Now, the British um, say America failed to win their war aims. So they wanted to force the British to lift their trade restrictions. We remember in part one, we spoke mm -hmm. about how the Royal Navy were bullying them. But they didn't manage to do this. So the British say that um, they won. <laughs> yeah. Now, America, uh, they think they won because they actually um, were victorious in some of the largest battles of the war, such as the Battle of New Orleans, where they repelled a massive British invasion, which had actually been planned on taking American territory. So the British were thinking, oh, well, whilst we're at war, we might as well get a bit more land for the empire. Yeah. We'll get some of this back. They also defeated uh, Tecumseh's Confederacy. Now, he was the commander of the First Nations people, wasn't he? he yeah. Um, had helped Brock out so bravely, uh, despite his tiny memorial. And with his defeat, the Americans claimed more of the First Nations territories. So whilst there's maybe no real clear winner, there was one clear loser. And well, that's the native people. It's rather sad, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so what do you think of Sir Isaac Brock? And I think it's going to be a tough act to follow. Maybe we could rate the Guernsey Greats. The different things I'd rate them on is epicness, probably, as in, like, how cool his thing was. Mm -hmm. um, intelligence. Mm -hmm. 
skill Global. and legacy. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah, legacy. Okay, so how epic was he? He was pretty cool. I'd probably give him a nine. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he was a pretty bold commander, leading from the front, shouting to keep his troops moving forwards. Yeah. Yeah. What about, what's the next one? Intelligence. Intelligence. He did seem pretty tactical. Mm hmm. So I'd probably give him a seven for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, he had a, maybe a, a sort of military intelligence. I don't know if he was. No, actually, I didn't really go into his um, sort of civilian side of his career. Because when he, he was the sort of commander of like Upper Canada, he also had a civilian as well as military position. So he was apparently quite astute politically, and I think how he improved the defences and really got the um, infrastructure set up for defending Canada. Yeah, and in part one, you mentioned. He was um, a good student and very clever at school, yet mm -hmm. he wasn't very well tutored. Uh, next one, I think we'll do we'll do epicness, intelligence, and legacy. Legacy, yeah. yeah. So legacy. Um, well, he did have a pretty big funeral. Um, mm, so it's monument. He's got universities named after him. The twenty fourth greatest Canadian in twenty eight history. The 20 something <laughs> <laughs> most popular Canadian ever. Okay, so for that, I will probably give him another nine. Yeah, I think he's yeah. actually got a pretty good legacy there. Yeah. Okay, but although some of the things I've read suggest that maybe he wasn't all that trusting of the natives' people, of the native people. Yeah. Um, but he did seem to have a real genuine respect for Tecumseh. Um, he also seemed very popular with his men. And he was a skilled politician, as well as a military commander. And to quote from a biography called The Astonishing General, The Life and Legacy of Sir Isaac Brock. Whether he was dealing with the natives, or the public, or even the rank and file soldiers, he had this ability to step outside of his class that was very rare for British generals. Everyone really seemed to enjoy his company. Oh, I think that's kind of a nice way to remember him. Yeah. There. Ultimately, his bold actions helped to change the war, as Canada was seen as very weak, but he gave them hope. The American army was maybe up to ten times larger than his, but through early planning and clever tactics, he won some major victories, often with very little loss of life. That's got to be really commended. Yeah. However, it was to be the same bold actions that ultimately led to his own death. And that's Brock. Yeah, I actually really enjoyed doing against the greats, and I'm sure we'll get some good ones. Mm -hmm. So if we add up his score, that'd be 9 plus 9, 18 plus 7, 25. Phew, we've got the maths right this time. Yeah. So it's not me doing it. <laughs> Antoine investigates. Stone Age quiz. Okay, so we have gone live to Granny and Gramps' house to test... Granny, Gramps' and Daddy's knowledge about the Stone Age in this brilliant quiz that we've come up with. Welcome to the Stone Age with your host, Anton. Hi, uh, thank you for joining us and let's test our contestants on what they know about the Stone Age. Let's introduce them. Daddy! Hi, I'm Daddy. I'm the youngest contestant, so I think I won't know as much as the others, and my buzzer sound is OG. Granny! Hello, I'm Granny, and my buzzer sound is IG. Gramps! Hello, I'm Gramps. I was actually born in the Stone Age, and my buzzer is Ruck. Question one. Who excavated Lavard Dolmen? Ruck. Gramps. Somebody called Lucas. I can't think of his Christian name. That's close enough, yeah. So the answer was FC Lucas, but Lucas, that is uh, good. So Gramps, one point to you. Question two. When did Guernsey become an island? A, 10,000 BCE, B, 7,000 BCE, or C, 4,000 BCE? Og. B. 
7,000 BCE. That's the correct answer. One point to Daddy. Question three. What helped preserve the bones of bodies buried in dolmens? Rock. Rock. <laughs> I no, th- I'm going to guess. I think it's because the soil was not acidic. It was alkaline and it was dry. I'm going to guess seashells. <laughs> yep, that is correct. It's actually limpet shells, but yeah. So another point to Gramps. Question four. True or false? Guernsey has no natural flint deposits. Ig. Ronnie? No, they don't. Correct. That's now a point to Granny. Question five. Which of these did Stone Age people eat? A. Seeds and grains. B. Meats. C. Berries. Rock dog. Gramps. I think they ate all of those items. Correct. So that's now a third point to Gramps. Question six. True or false? Fairies built Le Cruel Fair, the fairy caves. Og. True. <laughs> Egg. False. Well done, Egg. <laughs> I'm a bit unlucky there, um, Og. Yeah, I, I jumped in a bit quick there. <laughs> okay, so the youngest contestant is now last. Question seven. Where did the big stones come, r- come from for Stonehenge? Mm. Og. Okay, that's Daddy. I believe they came from Wales. I was going to say that. Congratulations. Thank you. So that means the halfway point, Gramps is winning with three points. Yes. And Daddy and Granny are level pegging behind with two points each. Question eight. Were there dinosaurs around in the Stone Age? Rock. <laughs> Gramps. Yes. <laughs> That's the wrong answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> What about birds? <laughs> yeah, but that's not really a dinosaur. Yeah. Og. Buddy! Folks, no. No dinosaurs around. Oh, congratulations. They all wiped out a long time before. Oh. Question nine. <laughs> Did they make bronze tools and weapons in the Stone Age? Uh, rock, hey. dig, Og. <laughs> <laughs> Gramps! No, they didn't. Oh, that, that was Stone a very... Age. Yeah, that was a very hard question. Oh, no, I was going to say, not bronze, but they did make weapons. Well, did you just ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> question 10. How many periods is the Stone Age divided into? A, 5, B, 1, C, 3. Rock. Gramps. Three. Yep, that's the right answer. The early Stone Age is uh, known as the Paleolithic. The middle Stone Age is the Mesolithic. And the new Stone Age is the Neolithic. Question 11. Were mammoths hunted to extinction by humans? Oh. Daddy? I believe the most recent research shows that they were the primary factor in the extinction of mammoths. Actually, there's a cave in Jersey, in the south of the island, which now even looks the coast, but 7,000 years ago or so, or maybe a bit less than that, um, it was used by Neanderthals, so not quite humans, and they hunted mammoth there, and they would have been overlooking grass plains at the time. Uh. Simple words, please. <laughs> <laughs> Was that right? I said simple words. Yes. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> Question 12. In which dolmen is there a face carved into the third capstone? Eek. Granny, there's vase. No. <gasps> no. 
Oak. Daddy. Dear Stoneman? <laughs> um, I'll give you that. It's just the wrong pronunciation. It's Dayu, Dayu. Dayu. Yeah, the Dayu. Thank you. Question 13. Did Stone Age people build stone houses? Pig? No. Rock. Granny? No. Congratulations, I said. lived in caves. Yeah, they live in caves and lots of um, different houses, so actually three other types. One of them was what's on the door, which is like lots of animal poo and stuff. But the other one was wood. Um, and the last one was animal skins, like a teepee. Question 14. What did uh, they use for cave paintings? A, animal blood. B, berries. C, charcoal. Or D, dirt. Rock. Oh, tramps. I think, again, they use all those different items in... No. So, anyone else want to capture that one? Og. Daddy. I think the dirt would wash off. So I think they would definitely use animal blood and berries. I reckon there's probably some evidence of charcoal being used at some point as well, so they would have been burning things in the caves. Yeah, probably charcoal, uh, but definitely animal blood and berries. So that's that's actually putting Daddy into the lead, pushing past um, Gramps with Granny slowly trailing behind with three points. <laughs> Question 15. Where did humans evolve from? Egg? Africa? Uh, I would like a more uh, exact answer. <gasps> well, this final question, you also get five points as well. <gasps> Rock! Oh, egg! egg. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, this is a little bit of a guess. It was definitely in Africa, and I'm going to say Ethiopia. <laughs> Not quite. Og. <laughs> Daddy. I believe it is very near the south of Africa in the country of Botswana. Congratulations, you have got even further in the lead. And you have won the entire game. What's my prize? Um, a hug. Hey! Thank you for joining us and uh, I hope you enjoy this lovely radio show. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Ho, 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 and see you next time. <laughs> that was awful, sorry. Ho, 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 we're sitting in our home. <laughs> okay, that was even worse. Um, let's cut this now. <laughs>